I'm Lee Bell, I'm director of the education program at Barnard, and I coordinated a three-year project called For the Public Good. And I'd like to just review what we've done over the past three years. Um, you're in the right year. <laughs> the conference didn't happen in fall 2011, but the series started then. And it came out of a, a Will and faculty seminar of uh, faculty from various departments across campus who were concerned about the increasing privatization of public goods. And so we wanted to um, spend some time reading about that, thinking about that, and then organizing this series, which was then supported by uh, money from the, the Virginia Gildersleeve Fund at Barnard. So the For the Public Good project uh, aims to look at the impacts of privatization across institutions and services typically considered as public goods. That is, goods that are supported by all and should belong to all. This slide <laughs> is of the inaugural panel, um, which had uh, Michelle Fine from the CUNY Graduate Center, Nancy Holmstrom, and David Wyman, and they um, define the public good from historical, philosophical, and economic perspectives, and pose such questions as, what does society gain by shielding areas of public life from the market? How do publicly created and supported institutions serve us now and in the future? Institutions such as public K-12 and um, schools and universities, public parks and libraries, public housing, public roads, public health, public airwaves, the environment. Even institutions like the military and the criminal justice system uh, that, that should be under public purview. How does public oversight and control of such institutions undergird the possibility of just and democratic community? What is our obligation to preserve, improve, and pass on public goods to those who will come after us? What happens when public goods are open to the market to be sold to the highest bidder? In uh, our next event in th that spring, uh, Diane Ravitch, um, who's an educator and critic, asked us to think about what happens when public schools are privatized through charters that selectively choose who they will educate and siphon resources away from the public system that serves all students. How do we preserve and improve a public system that um, works for everyone? What do we lose when tax incentives underwrite venture capitalists investing in and siphoning space from the public system while reaping private profit from these public goods? Then that same spring, Michael Kimmelman, who is um, the New York Times architecture critic, asked us to consider why public spaces are so important to civic life. What happens when such spaces are restricted? when private interests are allowed to use public spaces for their own profit-making ventures? How is public life impoverished when we lose access to spaces where people from every community can congregate, hopefully interact, maybe even debate and organize? Heather McGee joined us in the fall of 2012, and she works uh, for, De I think she's now president of Demos, and she spoke to her own generation of millennials and asked us to question notions that publicly supported government programs pit generations against each other. How can such programs work for the good of all of us? What are the intergenerational responsibilities we hold to each other through these publicly supported social programs? In the spring, Ricky Salinger and Dorian Warren discussed how government programs in the past have enhanced life for working people. Salinger's photography exhibit at Barnard um, illustrated how African Americans were able to use New Deal programs to claim citizenship rights through education, employment, housing, and political organizing. While recognizing the flaws in New Deal programs, nevertheless, because they were public and under public oversight, we could look at them and use them in effective ways. Dorian Warren illustrated the importance of unions as a counterweight to corporate interests that protect the rights and to protect the rights and interests of working people and the role of effective government regulation in ensuring these protections. Finally, that spring, our panel on accountability in New York City looked at the role of public parks and libraries, public housing, and public schooling for enhancing the city as a place where diverse classes of people can survive and thrive. 
and asked us to consider the threats these public institutions currently face from neoliberal plans to privatize them. And that brings us to today. Here we are, and our goal, our goal in this series has been to connect the dots. How can connecting the dots across different arenas of social life help us analyze more clearly the challenges we face from neoliberal privatizing projects? How can they help us organize broader coalitions that can work together to challenge privatizing efforts across various domains, thus strengthening our efforts in each area? Today's panel, panels this morning and afternoon offer ideas for such organizing and analysis. And I am pleased to introduce them now. So I invite you to come up the morning panel. All of these talks and panels can be accessed at this um, URL. So if you want to watch any of the panels or uh, talks that I outlined, you can see them at this site. OK. So let me introduce the moderator for our first panel, and then she will introduce the rest of the panel. OK. So Gail Cooper, our moderator, is the Vice President for Programs at ReGender, formerly the Council for Research on Women, the National Council for Research on Women, where she promotes the research of ReGender's member centers and fosters partnerships between the centers and policy, philanthropic, and advocacy organizations seeking high quality research through a gender lens. She's also creating space for research um, innovation to flourish between cross-sector stakeholders as they tackle burgeoning issues through the ex experience, burgeoning issues shaping the experience of women and girls. Gail joined ReGender in spring 2013 after working for many years at the Ford Foundation, uh, the International Rescue Committee, Women's Refugee Commission, and Human Rights Watch. So please join me in welcoming Gail and this panel. Thank you very much. Very happy to be here this morning. Uh, so I will introduce the, the, uh, the other members of the panel, starting on my immediate right, uh, is John Blasco, uh, who joined Fierce uh, in January 2009 as an organizer after a year of being uh, an active youth member. Uh, as a lead organizer of Fierce, John works with Fierce members to lead uh, campaigns and conducts organizing workshops to build uh, the leadership skills of LGBTQ youth of color. Uh, John is 25 years old and has been doing LGBT youth organizing for more than five years. Uh, John works on uh, Fierce's movement building work with coalitions such as uh, the Kiki Coalition and coordinates Fierce's work with Communities United for Police Reform. Uh, John has co-facilitated workshops at the National Gay and Lesbian uh, Creating Change Conference, uh, National Gay and Lesbian Task Force Creating Change Conference, and at other national conferences. And John is invested in creating a movement that fights for justice for all oppressed communities. Welcome, John. Uh, next to John is Nico Fonesca. Nico is uh, a 21-year-old youth organizer at Fierce. She is currently a campaign fellow uh, working on engaging LGBTQ youth of color in dialogue about the issues that, that impact uh, the constituency. Nico joined uh, the national team at Fierce uh, where she helps to develop curricula and co-facilitate a national LGBTQ youth of color summit in Chicago. Uh, in February 2013. Uh, Nico is the core leader of the organizing committee and supports the police accountability work that Fierce is holding down on the local level. Nico is a firm believer in self-determination and the importance of youth leadership in the movement. Welcome, Nico. Uh, next to Nico is Robert Hawkins. Uh, Robert is the McSilver Associate Professor in Poverty Studies at NYU Silver School of Social Work. Uh, he holds an endowed chair in poverty studies and has expertise in poverty and welfare, social capital use and development, race and social policy, community, community participatory research with mixed methodologies, and social policy analysis. Dr. Hawkins has approached the study and understanding of poverty from many perspectives. He conducted research with low-income families in New Orleans following Hurricane Katrina, engaged in in-depth studies with single mother-led households, and led international work in poor communities in the Philippines. 
Dr. Hawkins' current research focuses on the idea of poverty as trauma and addresses the link between social position, negative life events, and social capital usage among low-income people and families. He is particularly interested in the structural, sociological, and psychological barriers faced by low-income people trying to make a successful transition from poverty and welfare to positions of economic sustainability. Welcome, Robert. And thank you for not saying my age. <laughs> no problem. Uh, so next to Robert is Ede Fox, uh, a born and bred New Yorker who has worked for the, uh, for the New York City Council since 2006. First as a legislative and budget director for council member Melissa Mark Viverito, and then as chief of staff for council member uh, Jermaine D. Williams. Ede has helped negotiate sustainable development projects, bringing much needed jobs and affordable housing to local communities, and worked for legislation to protect tenants' rights. Ede has worked on numerous political and union campaigns, from helping healthcare workers get the contracts they deserve, to conducting grassroots organizing to elect progressive community-minded candidates at all levels of government, from district, le district leader to city council, congressional, gubernatorial, and presidential races. She is an active board member of Brooklyn Community Board 8 and serves as the chair of its Environmental Sanitation Committee, in which capacity she has championed statewide issues like uh, the anti-hydrofracking movement, as well as local concerns involving the responsible use of pesticides in public areas. Ede co-founded Prospect Heights Democrats for Reform, a new democratic club committed to fighting for transparency, accountability, and inclusionary democracy at the local level, and last year ran for a seat on the city council. Welcome, Ede. So um, I guess to, um, to get started, you know, we're sort of charged with um, looking at the idea of the public good in New York City, and I just want to throw out to the to the, uh, to the panel, so what does that mean sort of from your vantage points as activists, as those working um, you know, with, uh, with elected officials and as scholars? What does, what does the public good for New York City mean today? So for the public good, I think, so for me, uh, being a part of an organization that's dedicated to LGBTQ youth of color leadership here in New York City, and for those who may not know, LGBTQ is lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, and questioning, uh, youth of color here in New York City. Um, there is this, I think there is this gap between like education um, and education of different identities, education of communities that exist in New York City. Um, I know personally that New York wouldn't be New York wouldn't be a safe space if LGBTQ youth don't have safe spaces to go to here in New York City. Um, so as we talk about the public good as a whole, we have to think about the different communities and identities that exist in New York. So we have to think about LGBTQ. We have to think about immigrants. We have to think about homeless folk. We have to think about folks of different religion um, and thinking of how do we make things very accessible and safe for these different communities. And also, I, I say different, but there's also a lot of intersection between these different, between these communities. Um, so we have, to, we have to come to an understanding of how are we making things accessible and how are we providing resources to communities that normally don't have the resources um, that most people do have. Um, so I'll, I'll keep it short and just say that to start. Well, I, I think of the public good as um, the resources of the public, whether we're talking about open spaces, affordable housing, our education system. I think um, what, I want, I, what I focus on or try to focus on is making sure that all of the assets, whether it's our tax dollars, our infrastructure, go towards building better, um, better lives for New Yorkers and investing, investing our resources into improving the city as a whole. And that's something that we don't always see happening. And when I think about um, this concept of the public good, I think about this balance between rights and responsibility that the public um, government, for example, has you know, certain responsibilities to for, for accountability, for, for, for their citizenship. 
And part of the, those responsibilities is to make sure that rights are protected. So we have, a, we have a right to free space. We have a right to, regardless of who we are, to dwell and be where we want to be, how we want to be. And it is the responsibility, or it should be, the responsibility of, of the system of, the, of government to make sure that that can happen regardless of who you are and what you look like. I think that I, I agree with what everyone has said, but um, and I also think that part of it is culture too. Like um, a lot of things that happen in terms of um, laws that get passed and rights that um, that different communities have access to or don't. Um, a lot of it, it, it culture and 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 those things go hand in hand a lot of times and and um, can impact each other and I think that part of the process is to um, address the state of the culture um, and that can mean many things it can mean the culture of um, the relationship between um, the way society at large um, receives someone's identity, um, whether that's race, gender, class, um, or what have you, I think that the way that the person, the way that society at large receives that um, impacts greatly the experience of that person or of that community. Um, and I, I think that if, in order to address or create, you know, like, um, something that will benefit the public good. It's very necessary to address like core, um, the core roots of things and why um, certain things are in place or why um, culture is the way it is and, and then, you know, take it from there. Uh, okay, so picking up on, um, on your point, Nico, I'm, uh, I'm wondering sort of, you know, both in terms of the communities that you all belong to and the communities um, on whose behalf on whose behalf you work what um, and I, I define community fairly broadly as you know a sort of geographical space but then also sort of your tribe right whatever tribes you you know feel that you belong to um, who you see as your comrades um, and thinking particularly about sort of progressive um, activities actions movements and that kind of thing I'm wondering um, what are the what are the biggest challenges that you see for your communities, defined as you will, um, at this moment in time in New York? And I just you know just want to sort of say that we all recognize that this moment in time in New York is is fairly unique, in that we have just sort of left 12 years of a certain kind of administration and a certain kind of approach um, to many of the sort of public services and. Um, public uh, agencies that are that are uh, meant to be sort of equally shared, uh, and we are in very very early in a new administration. You know, in, in some ways we don't know sort of what's coming down the pike, and in other ways, you know, we've started to see some things. So, that being said, what what is what are the challenges that your communities are experiencing at this moment? Well, um, I've recently started working for now speaker Melissa Mark Viverito, so I've had a long relationship with her and I'm very excited to be working on her staff. Um, and for, for me, the thing that I have been most focused on over my years in government has been on making sure that people stay, you know, in homes and in homes that they can afford. And I, I personally feel that um, if you're if you don't have a, you know, a safe place to lay your head every night that you can afford, then everything else falls apart. And so that's for me is the basic thing that you have to deal with, uh, making sure that people have a place to live and that they have jobs that uh, pay a living wage and, uh, you know, and one that can support a family. So my work has been centrally focused around housing issues and economic development. And I've been really excited to see this new government, uh, we have a, a mayor who's very progressive, we have a council that's very progressive, and ready to work together towards building, uh, building up resources for the regular, everyday people of New York who need assistance. Um, so this, I, I think about it in four-year chunks, um, that we've got four years to really turn things around and really make a, a strong impact on 
what the city looks like going forward. And uh, we're working really hard to make sure that that happens. Um, and, uh, and that's particularly my role in the city council. And, uh, but you know, housing and, and jobs are really, I think, the, the primary thing that my tribe, anyway, <laughs> is looking, uh, looking for. I get very discouraged when I talk about communities, when I, when, as I understand communities. And I know communities aren't the kind of thing that's, that's supposed to discourage you. They're supposed to make you happy. But, but w as I look at data, as I do some of my own research, one of the things that I am noticing, and I don't know if anyone else even writes about this, and I, I did some work on it, is that one, because there are, for, for marginalized communities, because there are so few resources in those communities, and I don't mean by resources, I don't mean that people who love you and people who will take care of you, those exist in marginalized communities. But when I mean marginalized, I mean marginalized from the financial mainstream, marginalized by the government, marginalized by the police, and so on. So in those communities, as I look, as I look at this, it seems that one of the, it, for an individual, one of the best ways to sort of overcome to a degree that marginalization or, or poverty, for example, my field, is to leave the community. And people do that, and people, people often do that, and they come back, and, and, and um, sometimes they don't. And the reason leaving the community, and of course it doesn't work for all communities, but, but for very marginalized communities, the reason to leave the community seems to be working. And I'm, I'm not, this isn't really an opinion as much as, as an observation in looking at the data. Um, you leave the community because there are no resources in the community. There are no opportunities in the community. And, and the, the best way to leave, and I always I imagine sort of the family putting the child on a boat saying, go, you can do better. You know, float to the other, you know, float to the mainland. And, 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 and I think that's not because these communities are, we, we might look at that and, and, and it's okay, I, I'm, I'm used to people dis disagreeing about this. Uh, you can look at that and say, well, that's, that's, um, that means that, that there are no, no um, there's no connection in the community. I don't think that's it. I think there are no resources in the community. And in order to find resources, in order to find education, job opportunities, to, to not be harassed by the police, at least not as much, um, sometimes you have to leave. And people look at that and say, well, that's the community. And I think that's us. I think that's, that's, that's the city. That's, the, that's New York. That's the government. That's not putting resources into a school so now I, you know, I'll, I'll, you know, in, instead of going to a school in my community, I'll go to a school somewhere, somewhere else. I'll find a charter school that, that, that recruits from all over the city and not from my community. That's, that, so I get discouraged. I, I know the communities, you know, my mother loves me, my daddy loves me, my friends support me, and they're all poor too. And, uh, but where are the resources? And, and so that's why I get a little discouraged. Sure. I think that's a really important point. And one of the things that, uh, I, that government can help address, I think investing in uh, commercial districts in some of these communities, helping to build wealth locally so that people feel like there's a reason to Absolutely. stay stay in the community and can see, um, can see success or a path to success within the same community. And that, that kind of thing is doable, but the willingness has to be there, and that's what isn't always there. And also, um, you know, just a, a path where we can see and understand how to get there. And, uh, and so, you know, heartening to hear that people are doing this kind of policy research um, we, need, we need that kind of uh, data and that, um, that kind of, uh, those kind of ideas brought into government and, um, and then on the inside we can work out a path about how to get there and how to make it happen, but that is a very important point. Thank you. I think also, it, I think if Nico and I sat here 
and listed out the issues <laughs> that impact LGBTQ youth in New York, um, we'd be here for a really long time, um, to be honest. I think some of the issues that come off, that come up to my mind are like homelessness, mm -hmm. our policing, our healthcare, our education, economic development, um, and they're not separate from each other either, right? When we, let's take policing for example, or let's take neighborhoods that we have seen um, go through gentrification, right? When we talk about let's improve a neighborhood, but what does improve really mean? Um, and just thinking specifically around time, I, and I gotta give a little history too, around like Times Square and the West Village. Mm -hmm. Two neighborhoods in New York that were predominantly like occupied by LGBTQ people. And then those neighborhoods started to get gentrified. What supported the gentrification was policing. And then those communities started to get displaced. Um, in the West Village specifically, you see a ton of youth that may be homeless, they may not be homeless, um, but then are impacted by things like quality of life violations, are impacted by the broken windows policy. Um, things that we've seen under Mayor uh, Rudy Giuliani administration, right? Um, and things that we see coming back because now William Bratton is the new NYPD commissioner and he was one of the, he was the commissioner that enforced quality of life violations. So we're starting, as we, as we talk a less about stop and frisk under Ray Kelly, now we're talking more about people getting stopped on the subways and people getting stopped for loitering. Um, and these are all things that impact LGBTQ youth, especially when a young person is homeless and doesn't have anywhere to go because there's not enough money um, or they're not, the, those safe spaces don't exist for queer youth in New York um, to go to the drop-in centers that they used to go to or go to a shelter because the shelter is not safe um, because they can't be in the same space um, or because they're put into a space that doesn't match how they identify. Um, in terms of their gender identity. So they're, like, the list can go on and on. One of the things I think about also is just the education system. Um, I was really excited because city council member Daniel Drum actually recently hosted um, a public hearing on, he, he's the new chair of the education committee and hosted a hearing on LGBTQ youth experiences in schools. To my knowledge, this is the first time that has ever happened in New York. And it, it's, it's worrisome to know that this is the first time that that has ever happened in New York, but it's also exciting to see that something like that did happen. Um, and as we, as we just think about identities, gender identity, sexual orientation, these are things, you know, for our, for our tribe, I guess you could call it, um, we wonder why there's no LGBTQ history curriculum in the Department of Education, right? Why, why aren't New Yorkers or whoever, whoever is living here going through the education system and getting some knowledge on LGBTQ history so that we can have a better understanding of different identities so that we don't go into the world and then we face all these types of discrimination, stereotypes, and brutality. Um, and one of the things we've been talking about recently too is just like the need for something simple like gender neutral bathrooms in a school would be amazing to support LGBTQ youth in the education system. Or something simple like gender neutral bathrooms in public parks um, where we see a lot of uh, LGBTQ youth hang out in the West Village. Um, so those are like, those are to name a few of the issues um, and just really understand that a lot of these issues, they, they aren't separate. Like there, there's a ton of intersection between these issues, homelessness, education, policing, economic development. Uh, yeah, um, I keep, I've been thinking about Gail's question and talking about like, um, what are the issues most impacting the communities that you organize around or work for, and also what uh, the communities that you are a part of. And I think what's really special in my case is that I'm part of the community that I organize around, and that offers me um, a kind of uh, 
multiple perspectives on what it really means to be a queer and trans youth of color in New York City. And I think um, what's, um, what's important about being in, in, this, in the position that I'm in is that um, as youth organizers, we not only have our own experiences and our own um, traumas and our own um, uh, you know, formula of the oppression that we face um, as individuals and thinking about the intersections of our personal identities, but just thinking about the, the community of queer and trans youth of color and how very um, broad our experiences are and, and how, how different they can be and also how similar. And I think um, one of the things I was thinking about as people were talking, I was just like writing down, everybody was talking. Um, I, I was thinking about like what John was talking about, access to safe space and like um, the pier in the West Village. These are things that are part of our history as people, you know, and, and yeah, they're not things that people learn about. So when you go to the West Village or when you gentrify the West Village, you're not really understanding the weight of what you're doing, which is simply, you know, I don't know, opening up a 5,000th Starbucks or something, you know? Um, and it's like, oh, sweet, like I could get a frap down the block, but it's really much bigger than that because that Starbucks is going to bring a whole demographic of people. Um, and then those people are going to move in. And then those people are, are going to be part, are going to be the recognized community of that area. Because community, the definition of community varies to people. And what I, what I experience as a young person, um, especially um, knowing that I'm queer and, um, and uh, a person of color and I'm young, I see that the village is part of my history and I am the only person that knows that and nobody else does except for the other members of my community. And that's hard because what that means is that when people are gentrifying and when I'm trying to organize around um, trying to keep access to this space, um, I, it's not understood, you know, it's not translated well because they don't understand the weight of it, like I said. Um, and just to think of all the things that have happened on the pier and all the powerful leaders who were part of my community who have lived on the pier at one point and who have lived and fought and passed on and then I, I carry their legacy on and, and to feel like that safe space is being changed or taken from me, you know, that's hard because we are already a community who is, 40% um, of all homelessness is our LGBTQ youth. That means that 40% of, of homeless people in New York City are queer and trans. And, and that means that all of those people are, I mean, I'm, I'm saying the same thing over and over, but um, that, that means that those people don't have somewhere safe to stay. And let alone, you know, sleep, let alone just be for a few minutes, you know, or go to the porta potty and use the bathroom or and brush their teeth because that's the only place that they can do that, you know? And so these things, like they're, like John was saying, they're all connected. Homelessness and policing, those things are connected because obviously a homeless uh, young person who has nowhere to use the restroom, no money to go to that new restaurant in the West Village that you need to buy something to use the bathroom, they don't have the money to do that. So where are they gonna brush their teeth? Something that we all take for granted, you know, a lot of the time, and we don't think is a big deal, but it's so necessary and vital to just the human experience. And yet our community survives. And then I was thinking about, we were saying about um, that we often have to leave our communities in order to find resources that we need because they're just not there. And geographic, geographical, geographical, that's not a word, geographic um, <laughs> uh, communities, I mean. So we leave those communities and we go somewhere else. And what that does is that breaks us from our community, which is a lot of where we get our survival, um, our survival um, advice, experiences that our ancestors and, and comrades before us pass on to us. And then we don't have access to that either. And, and it's all because in order to survive, we have to continue moving because everything, 
every space that we have um, claimed as ours has been taken. And, you know, that sucks simply because that, you know, it just, it takes so much from, from the experience of what it is to be a queer and trans youth of color who's homeless, who has to go to school or can't go to school anymore or can't go to college and then needs a job. And, you know, it's, it's all so intricate and connected that it's really vital to understand that just like a Starbucks opening, which I don't think there is one, but a star, there, oh my God, knock on wood. But, <laughs> but, but a Starbucks opening, um, like right across the street from the pier, that, that small, uh, you know, that business owner who decides to buy that, um, that storefront, that can totally change and impact an entire community. And I feel like because there's such a lack of education on really the importance and significance of, of um, being queer and trans and young, because there's a lack of education on that, there's a lack of knowledge of the severity of making a small decision like that, you know? Sure. I, I think you make a really great point about space and where people are allowed to, to be. And I, I think that, um, New York has not done a, as good a job as maybe some other cities about creating open space where you can be without being loitering or uh, breaking the law. Uh, I, and this is something I, I'm particularly interested in terms of like the waterfront. You know, the way New York has grown up we, uh, or developed, we often block access to the waterfront. We block access to uh, public spaces. And, uh, and I think that this is something that we really need to address. It was something that was started to be addressed during um, you know, the occupation of Zuccotti Park. And I feel that the way that sort of resolved itself um, really displayed the problem that we have in uh, New York City. And the gentrification I, um, really accelerate or, or exacerbates the problem. And I think I can think of a small example in my own neighborhood, which is rapidly gentrifying. There was a, a very fancy luxury building that went up, and there happened to be a park bench on the sidewalk in front of it. It was near, the, the whole building is near a park, and you know a lot of kids used to hang out on that bench, and the building tore the bench down because they don't want that kind of activity in front of the building. So here we see a, priv uh, you know, a private corporation claiming public space and, and actually taking it away from us. And, and that is a real problem and, and one that um, I, I don't know how we address. I mean, obviously, anytime time public property is taken, it needs to be, you know, that needs to be rectified. But this is a bigger question of where people are allowed to be and, and who gets harassed for being in those spaces. Sure. Yeah, and then there's like the the definition um, of community and what it means to community members who are community members because they they have an apartment in the in the neighborhood and then community members like myself who I live on the Lower East Side but I am a community member of the West Village because I am an LGBTQ youth of color and my ancestors live and died on that pier and so you know I will too and and that's and and that's not because I, I'm a, allowed that luxury. That's because I'm demanding that I get that, you know, because I am taking ownership of something that I know belongs to my community. But but that that doesn't mean much when it comes to um, you know um, someone who is. Uh, paying rent in that community and and um, circulating money and and part of the the rise of the wealth of that particular area, because me me telling you it's important to me you know to be there because it's the pier and it's historical duh it, that doesn't mean much to somebody who's like I want money or or you know um, or police who are are constantly harassing um, young people, young people of color um, and queer and trans people in that particular neighborhood because it's like, all right, I'm not, to you, I'm not part of this community because I'm not paying rent. And so that means that anything I'm doing, if I'm standing on the street and, and there's also someone next to me who's standing on the street, but they live down the block, I'm going to be harassed, you know, because you know that person or you, you see that person around, you know that they, that they have an apartment here and you don't, you don't think that I do because just by looking at me, you know, you can assume that I don't live in this neighborhood, so I'm clearly not part of the community. But little do you know? Yeah. <laughs> so uh, just, you know, sort of 
I, my brain riffed on a lot of things that, um, that were said, and the, the place that I've sort of settled for at least a little bit is um, the idea of migration. Uh, I think, Robert, when you, you know, sort of talked about, you know, folks needing to leave their communities and sort of being, you know, sort of lifted, you know, in their, in the exit um, with the hopes that leaving will, would, would offer them um, more possibility, opportunity, um, sort of health. Uh, it made me think about the great migration, right, of black folks from the South. And, you know, just sort of in the nutshell of that, you know, that happened because of Jim Crow practices. And uh, if you, right, and so, so you know, folks were ferrying the, the young people out of the community in order to save them, right? Um, particularly, you know, um, young black men, right? And uh, and then thinking about New York and thinking about sort of, you know, I moved to New York in 1995. And if I think about the New York that I moved into and I think about the New York that I live in today, I, you know, it really is just this sort of crazy migration moment, right? Where, you know, in Manhattan, for example, right, I, I started out living in Park Slope and I got priced out of Park Slope because you know, Manhattanites from the Upper West Side were being priced out of Manhattan, and they were looking for other places to go, and so they ended up moving to Brooklyn, where it was sort of cheap and kind of cool, and, you know, and, you know it started in Park Slope, and then it moved to Fort Greene, which I also moved to after Park Slope, and got priced out of Fort Greene, and now I'm living in Flatbush, and, you know, I don't think I'm going to get priced out of Flatbush because it's a different... Uh, the, the, the gentrification possibilities are really different in Flatbush, and yet the neighborhood has changed radically. And so, you know, thinking about uh, folks being pushed out of places like Astoria, Jackson Heights, the Lower East Side, the West Village, um, you know, the South Bronx, right, uh, you know, Bed-Stuy, Fort Greene, and, you know, folks are being sort of pushed out, you know, pushed to margins, pushed to pockets, Right, and around that is just this incredible wealth, right? And the you know the gentrification process um, looks a lot like uh, a, a lot like a sort of takeover, right? And so I'm wondering, um, in particular, Amanda and Robert, in the work that you're doing around poverty and precarity and policing, um, if you and this maybe is putting you on the spot a little bit, if there are sort of parallels in your mind in terms of sort of how Jim Crow style practices, um, you know, inspired the, 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 the migration, the great migration, if there is a parallel to some extent. And, you know, I'm also sort of referencing um, Michelle Alexander a little bit here. So I'm, I've been looking at census data with some uh, colleagues down south, and we were, we were looking at migration. And one of the things that we're seeing in, in New York um, is that New York's, you know, in New York, it, I think for the past 20 years, New York has been uh, sort of losing population. But uh, in this year, it's been, in the past couple of years, been gaining again. And so we were looking at census data, and one of the things that we noticed, at least for African Americans, and I can't say this for other groups yet, um, African Americans are actually leaving New York City, um, more leaving than, than, than are coming. And the people who are leaving, right now it looks to us, and because the census data, is, it's, it's a little bit difficult to figure out uh, income, but it looks to us, looking at census data and labor, labor statistics, uh, labor department statistics, is that it's the middle class that's leaving. And this is the worst part of your population that you want to leave, um, because when the middle class leaves, it, it's, it's, it follows a pattern of poverty. When the middle class leaves, um, poverty sort of uh, gains a stronghold. And um, so that, that pattern is, is one that, um, that we should pay some attention to. And if you think about the, the policies uh, in New York, uh, it, it makes sense, it, the, the policies and, and the expense of living in New York, it, it, it actually makes makes a lot of sense. And I, I wanted to say something ab about um, 
of Nico. And, and this is one of the things that she had mentioned. Not living in a neighborhood is not against the law. <laughs> <laughs> I, it, it just, I, I, when I hear this, it, it just drives me nuts. So speaking of Jim Crow, in the South, and actually in the Northeast too, there were these towns called sundown towns, where um, often it was black people had to be off the streets and out of town by, by sundown. But sometimes it was Native Americans, sometimes it was Jews, sort of depending on the minority population of, of the community. And the last time I checked, New York City is not a sundown town. <laughs> and, and we use these, these laws about loitering, what are tourists doing? <laughs> when a tourist comes to the West Village and they're looking around and they don't really have anywhere to go, and I've been a tourist and I know this is what you do, you sort of look around. <laughs> Why, how is that? And I, I know the police would argue this point probably and the shop owners might argue this point, but how is that on his face different than what anyone else is doing, what LBGTQ youth are doing, or anyone else. And, and so it drives me crazy. I, I, I've been following the, the, the history of, of the peer and what goes on there, and, and I've always asked, asked that question. Like, at what point did the West Village become a sundown town, and for whom? Mm -hmm. Well, I think we know the answer to that one. But, mm -hmm. but, but at what point did that happen, and, and, and why? Do we allow that to continue to happen? That's all I'd say. <laughs> I, I think you raised some great points about migration. And uh, on an anecdotal level, uh, this summer I ran for city council. Unfortunately, I did not win. Uh, but it was a really great experience, and I did very well. But I spent a lot of time walking door to door, knocking on door to door, talking to people. And I would spend you know, a huge amount of time in these little pockets of communities. And one of the interesting things that I saw was that there would be like a whole block of brownstones and half the block, the owners all moved in and bought their homes around the same age. So they all died or retired at the same time and they all sold their homes to move back down south uh, at the same time. So, you know, within a five year period, you'll have what was once, you know, almost an entirely black middle class neighborhood turn entirely white. And I was like, oh, isn't that interesting how the demographics are, you know, such a part of this. And uh, in what I, I started to ask questions as I talked to people and I came to learn that uh, in many cases, you know, their kids had either left the city and weren't interested in, in owning a home in Brooklyn or they didn't have enough money to buy out their parents and send them back down south, so they would end up selling it out of the, the, um, the family. And, and the people who have the money to buy it were typically you know, a, a, a white middle class family from the Upper West Side or wherever. And so what I, I saw was that what we really need to be focusing on is building wealth in our community so that people who live there can buy their, the homes there. And, and that was what was so frustrating. And, um, and, you know, and I don't begrudge them, you know, selling their homes. I mean, the, the whole point of buying a home or the American dream is to buy your home, you know, make some money, cash out at the end and go and retire, you know, someplace beautiful and warm. So that's fine and that's great. <laughs> um, but we got to figure out how to help people on the younger end. And, and uh, gentrification was the number one issue that people wanted to talk about when I was on the campaign. And there's no easy answer. I don't know any particular solution. But the thing that I focused most on was finding ways to build wealth. And to me, building wealth means um, creating jobs that cr have a living wage, making sure that people in the community have access to whatever education or resources they need to be prepared for those jobs, and to give them the ability to start companies or uh, you know, entrepreneur opportunities that, that continue to create those kinds of jobs. And, and that's all I could think of to do. Um, and there's a lot of opportunity for that. You know, New York has been losing its manufacturing space and these are typically places where you can have uh, living wage jobs or higher level, uh, higher paying jobs. And uh, you know, so we've got to focus on supporting and, and uh, holding on to those um, those uh, businesses, and it, to me, that's the only solution that I can think of at this point in time. But we we really have to focus on building wealth and helping people stay and and buy. 
I just wanted to add that um, that made me think about when uh, like uh, a young queer um, person of color is kicked out of their home and their parents um, decide that they need to move um, and then that young person ends up in New York City by themselves completely. And it, ha it has happened many times, obviously, because we see this pattern in, in the homeowners. And so those homeowners have children, and some of them are queer <laughs> and trans, and, and, they, and some of them get kicked out. And, and then what does that mean? It's, I'm kind of asking a question. Um, but what does that mean for for those young people and what they have what they have access to what they um, what kind of reconciliation they can possibly have um, any chance of having um, if their parents had to leave um, to like Virginia or somewhere really far from here um, what does that mean for for them and 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 then how does that impact their path in life um, because one something like that can impact the it can totally change the whole path of someone's life. And I think that that's really important to think about. Um, I, I just keep thinking, I, everything just connects to like, yeah, just, right? It's so, it's, it's really intense. It's intense, mm -hmm. a little overwhelming. Two, two things I wanted to say. The first one was really short, was that the first example of gentrification is when you start seeing a neighborhood and the name of the neighborhood has changed. <laughs> like that's the first example, right? We talk about, I live in the Lower East Side as well, in Alphabet City, n mm -hmm. the East Village, mm -hmm. that's where I live now. Or when you see wa yeah. the East Village? No, the East Village. <laughs> the East Village. No. Or like Washington Heights, Waha. Like right. re Waha, sure, sure, sure. really? <laughs> like that's the name you gave it if you wanted to change it? Well, that's the first example I wanted to share. Um, and just, just bring back the importance of accessibility, right? And accessibility on not, not just gender identity, not just uh, um, different identities, but also age accessibility, right? How are we creating spaces for people who are young, who are leaders in this movement? If we wanna talk about the public good, we need to have more young people in, in spaces, in, in leadership positions, right? In sharing their solutions for some of the problems. Oftentimes in the work that we do at Fierce, we see a lot of, a lot of folks saying, oh, well, let me tell you what's, what's best for the young people. Let me tell you, these kids need, <laughs> kids is the first problem that you <laughs> call those kids, but let me tell you what they need. No, communities that are facing issues, they are like they are the folks that have the best solutions for the issues that they are facing or are impacted by. A young person can tell you what the solution is to their problem before anyone else can. Um, and also just accessibility around language too. Um, and I, I think about this one particular th situation that has to do with policing, um, but there was an uh, 87-year-old man, uh, Mr. Kang Wan, who was stopped by the cops because of jaywalking, but he didn't speak English, and the NYPD didn't provide someone to interpret. He ended up going to the hospital because of injuries that were, that that he got from the NYPD and that encounter because he didn't understand what was going on because it wasn't made for him to understand what was going on. That's just one example. Other examples too are like spaces like this, right? I wonder when we, when we think about interpretation or even sometimes we think about it at Fierce when we put big events on, are we providing interpreters for the event? Are we having people who don't speak English feel safe and comfortable and sharing their experiences in, in, in event spaces as well. Um, and I've also been in event spaces where folks are like, no, I don't wanna hear another, another language. But if we're talking about the public good, then we need to be balancing out all the different kinds of languages, all the different types of identities that are here in New York if we wanna build some type of movement. A movement is bigger than ourselves as individuals. It's much bigger than us. It's, and I, I had to learn that, I learned that coming to Fierce, that the work that I do, there is a piece of me, of course, that, that keeps me wanting to stay involved in social justice organizing, but I know that this is much bigger than me. It, in, it impacts 
my community as a whole, and it impacts folks that don't identify as how I identify. So as we continue to have these conversations, that's really important to come to the understanding on how are we creating spaces that are not just about myself and my comfort, but have like a bigger, a, a bigger, greater vision. I just wanted to say, yes, I agree. Because um, <laughs> uh, we were talking about it earlier, about like accessibility, because um, like I'm, I'm the only youth here, I'm, right? I'm the only, yeah? Um, <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm the, you know, yeah, oh, my bad, my bad. Uh, assuming I'm, I'm I the- I aged out of youth. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm 21 years old, so I'm, I'm going to say safely, hopefully, that I'm the youngest person here on the panel. <laughs> and um, I was nervous about that. This is my first panel. I've never like um, been on a panel, uh, obviously, because this is my first one. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> I was just nervous because I was thinking, like, OK, what are the conversations? Because I can talk about many things, but it's about the way that you talk about it. And that's something we, we t focus on a lot at Fierce is um, the power of young people is um, is massive, and it's beyond anything that we really can give ourselves credit for. But that, that can be easily overlooked when you're um, using language that's not accessible to young people or is not in the language that they understand. Um, and so I was nervous because I was like, man, what if like there's this word or like somebody asked me a question specifically to me and they use this word. And then I'm like, I'm just gonna ask them what it means because you know, that's how I, I, I'm comfortable with that and I'm, you know, like comfortable with my own intelligence, but I, it's not just for that, it's because I want to, um, wherever I go, create this atmosphere that, that that's okay, you know, to not know what a word means and to ask what it means because that's just simply what needs to happen and, and we all need to be comfortable with that because that is just part of, of human interaction and finding what are the best ways to communicate with each other and if we want like um, to think about like what is um, going to help us um, progress uh, or create things for the public good, then that means making things accessible because we all need to be at the table. And, we, and even, if, even if we get to that step where we're all at the table, then we need to make, take it even further and make sure that the people, everybody at the table knows what's going on, you know, and that everybody can understand what everybody else is, is saying. In, in that vein, um, right, on this panel, we have sort of a, a number of sectors represented, right? Sort of activists, community-based um, grassroots work, uh, research and academic work that, you know, wends its way into the community and having sort of direct impact on the community. And then also sort of the, the, uh, the kind of political actor. Um, and so I'm wondering how, so, you know, given everything that has been said about how, you know, we all need to come to the table and, we all need to hear each other and all that. So right now on the ground, how's that working out? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like how are how are are you all and sort of you know in the larger since you know as you said, John, it is larger than any one of us. Mm -hmm. how, how is that playing out um, around the issues that we've been talking about? Yeah, I think one thing. So Fierce is a member of a citywide campaign called Communities United for Police Reform, and this is a CPR for short. Um, and, and this is a campaign that um, helped, uh, that, that supported the work of uh, council members like Jamani Williams and Brad Lander um, and other council members to, to introduce and pass the Community Safety Act, um, which were a package of two bills regarding discriminatory policing. One around an inspector, having an inspector general um, to look over systemic issues of the NYPD um, that's separate from the NYPD and also looking at a ban to profiling, um, not just on race, but on gender identity, on immigration status, on housing status, uh, age, sexual orientation, um, HIV, um, and religion. Um, and this was a historic moment for, at least for members of Fierce um, and for the organization to be in a space where it wasn't just like community-based folk 
It was community-based organizers, it was faith leaders, it, it was researchers, lawyers, um, council folk. Um, it was like all of these different stakeholders coming together because we all have this common, um, this common understanding that there's an issue with policing and the way that it has been going and the impacts that it, have, it has had on different communities. Um, and I say different, I say communities too because this um, citywide campaign represented LGBTQ folk, it represented um, straight allies, it represented uh, Muslim communities, immigrants, homeless folk, and the list goes on and on and on. Um, and this was not the first time that folks have come together to the table of different identities, um, but was really historic to see just like what we were able to introduce and bring into New York City. Um, even with our former mayor, uh, Mayor Bloomberg, um, like opposing, <laughs> opposing the Community Safety Act. Um, so that was really exciting. And that was just one example, and I can talk more about it. You could talk to me after this. Um, but one thing that I wanted to say too, uh, Fierce on an individual level over the years has worked a lot with um, researchers and also with bringing in uh, urban designing and urban planning into our organizing work. And that I feel like has made like, a tremendous, I don't know, that has supported us in our work even greater than it did before. Um, to have researchers and to have urban designers come in and create tools for participatory action research to support campaigns that young people are leading were, was amazing. And the way that they did it was that they said, okay, you are the community stakeholders, you are the leaders, you know what the issue is. Tell us what you want to see, and we will support you by bringing our expertise to the table and making it happen. It wasn't like, oh, we're gonna tell you what we think is best for you. It was, you're the community. You are the folks impacted by this issue. You need to tell us what you wanna see, and we will help you with that. And that's how it worked. And that was the only way it was going to work in a successful way by the folks who are directly impacted by the issue, taking leadership and, and just visioning what they wanted to see and having other folks around the table support that. I, I'm involved in a, uh, actually I just finished a community participatory uh, research project in, um, uh, in, 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 in Harlem. I, and, I, 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 um, and I've worked with various other agencies, organizations, I'm starting a project now, um, also a community participatory project that involves sex workers, um, women, young women who've been trafficked, um, and also working with a couple of different agencies around that. And the, um, the issue is that, well, I, I should say, one of the ways I, I get my data out um, is I actually do things like this. I, I almost always say yes when someone asks me to speak. And it's not generally because I like to hear myself talk, but as an academic, you know that there's a little bit of that. Um, but it's a way to reach a lot, of, a lot more people, and it's, it's also a way to, to mobilize people. Because I can't actually do all the things that people ask me to do. But I know that I might have data, I might have access to data, I might know someone else. So that keeps me involved. So I can work on the, the projects I'm working on as well as talk about, um, as well as maybe hopefully connect um, some people to other people. And it's, uh, but I find it very interesting because I'm working, I have this project in Harlem. I'm, I'm also doing work in the Philippines. And it's interesting for me anyway, who I never, did international work until recently. And uh, one reason I didn't do international work was because I always said that, you know, we love other people's poverty. We love, mm -hmm. like, <laughs> we love Africa, African poverty. We love you know, Filipino <laughs> poverty. And so I, I was very reluctant. But then NYU started taking over the world. And, <laughs> and one of the things I learned very quickly is that if I wanted to get tenure, I needed an international project. And so, <clears throat> 
I had to, I had to make Keeping that work. Um, <laughs> but, but here's what I've noticed about working in two very different countries. Um, well, one is that colonialism is not dead. Um, that's one. But <laughs> the, the other thing I learned was that when the work, when I say I'm working with low income women who have been abused, some men who have been abused and they're in shelter and we're working on um, getting, uh, connecting them with jobs and job skills and emotional regulation and people say that's nice. And then when I say I'm working with kind of a similar population in the Philippines, um, people get really excited and they say, how can I help? <laughs> and I, I'm, I'm, I'm fascinated, it, it actually just, for me, it just proves my original theory that we love other people's poverty. But the, and, and, and so, so in thinking about this, I'm thinking, wow, one of the things I've seen in working with communities and community coalitions is that sometimes sustainability is very difficult, in, in the US anyway. And part of that is you, you do your project, you're done, and then there's, there's other things. I feel that I could sustain this project in the Philippines for the rest of my career and get lots of help from lots of other people here in, in New York, people who, who have even worked with me uh, in, in Harlem. And, and I think that's one of the, the challenges. And, and, I, and I have to say, working internationally, you can see results rather quickly. I'm working in a small village, so you can see those results really quickly. Here, you've got you've to sustain it over time. And, and you've got to be focused. And so it, it can be a little bit more sexy to work in the Philippines. And, and I think that's, that's a problem. I, I have no solution. I'm not asked, offering a solution. But in terms of, of you know, sometimes I, I leave the Philippines, and I'm on the plane, and I'm in tears. Not because, sometimes because of what I've seen, but because I know that when I get back here and I start to do my work here, I'm not gonna get the same kind of reception that I got there. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's a lot harder. So, so that's, that's just an observation. Thinking about uh, the, non the, uh, the nonprofit industrial complex, right? And sort of thinking about like sustainability in light of that. And I think also as researchers, you all probably encounter this. Um, in terms of sort of funding and you know the sort of the the need to publish, and a day I'm sure you you know experience this in terms of that four year cycle, right? But there is almost always a sort of time limit on things, and there's almost always an experience, a sort of Groundhog's Day experience, um, whether it's you know sort of from one research project to another, or from one sort of nonprofit grant to another, or from one action to another, or one election cycle to another. There's almost always this experience of, and now we're gonna just, you know, sort of fix everything again. And then, you know, you sort of do that work, and then suddenly, you know, someone has a new idea that, you know, in, in, involves different language, but sort of the same, all the same mechanisms and all the same, many times the same players and many times the, the same money and it just sort of goes around and around and around and so you're kind of on a track rather than feeling like you're really building a movement well, or something. I mean, as much as I'd like to think, um, you know, every four years we, or eight years we reinvent ourselves, we've actually gone, uh, you know, a good 20 years with pretty much the same policies in New York. So, you know, this is like the first time uh, you know, it's so funny. I've worked in, in government quite a while. I'm, you know, I'm very progressive, very political, and, you know, my friends are all in the advocate community, and, you know, we're all progressive and activists. And now, all of a sudden, you know, we're all in the candy store. You know, de Blasio's hired everybody. You know, Melissa's hiring everybody. So all my friends, you know, we all work in the in government. And so we have this really unique moment where we have super smart people with really the right politics who understand the issues and understand um, the policies inside, and we have this opportunity to, uh, to do really great things. I don't know what's gonna happen. Uh, I really hope we do well. Um, but uh, this is, I think, a brand new moment and um, you know, it, it, that we haven't seen in a very, very long time. But um, what I, I wanted to say was in terms of the policies, 
you know, we really rely in government on the advocates to, to come up with the ideas, to help us understand, understand them, the, the data behind them. And the problem that we most often have, though, is figuring out how. Because it's one thing, you know, we all understand why we need affordable housing. It's quite another to understand how to get there and what does it mean to create a new policy or an, a law and you know where does that fit in the administrative code? What does that really cost and is it sustainable and where are we gonna get the money to do it? And so I find very often you know, the advocates and the politicians are talking past each other where you know, the advocates are saying, here's why, and, you know, we on the other side are saying, well, tell me how. I mean, I get why. Let's talk about how. So I, you know, want to, I want to try to bring those worlds together. And uh, in my former life, I was getting um, a PhD in anthropology. So I do understand a little bit, you know, the academic um, perspective. And and, um, and enjoy it. But, um, so I, I feel like I'm a little bit better at sort of translating the two worlds. Uh, <laughs> but, um, but that's something that, you know, that's a tension that always exists. Now, I don't know this four years um, if that's going to be an issue because most of those advocates are now inside. And so we're now working side by side. And I'm saying to them, okay, well, now you're here. You, you under, you're starting to understand the, the the difficulties here and you're starting to you know read the city charter and understand the code and understand what we've been talking about all these years so I, I I'm very excited to see what happens over the next four years and I, I think it's gonna have a really long-term impact on the city and uh, so I don't know I'm keeping my fingers crossed <laughs> so uh, I would love to open it up for questions from you all In some ways, it's like playing a game of telephone, right? Like, so, I, you know, right. I think that that oftentimes researchers publish their findings in a very measured and, you know, somewhat cautious way. And then someone picks up the findings and, you know, reads, reads the study and writes about it and you know, maybe sort of shifts the language a little bit. And then someone else picks up that writing and then it sort of like spirals out and by the time it sort of comes back to the researcher, it's saying maybe the opposite of what the researcher really meant or um, has sort of jumped off into lots of different other places. And some of that is related to technology and sort of the, that, that um, relentless desire for um, information and content to seed sites and all sorts of things, you know, blogs, listservs, et cetera. Um, and I, I, you know, I think that, uh, you know, Amanda, your, your caution is really um, well stated, in part because, you know, on some level, the entire stop and frisk policy is based on a sort of false interpretation of data. Right, so the so stop and frisk is based on this idea that, you know, you know, coming from the Giuliani administration, that sort of if you kind of intervene at the low level, then you know you will, um, you will you will, you know, sort of intercept the rise of crime, and then it will, you know, ensure that your municipality or whatever sort of is not experiencing deep crime, and then they used sort of the statistics of the lower, you know, the sort of decrease in crime from, say, 1990, you know, to, you know, or even earlier, 1980 to, you know, 2000 is like, see, this is proof. But actually, you know, sort of as people scrolled back and kind of, you know, investigated those claims, it was found not to, to there was found not to be a sort of causal link between those. And so entire, you know, city policy, New York City policy, but then sort of spread around the country based on just really poor interpretation of data, so. And, and I think um, if you look at a lot of policy, at, as, as policies develop over time, and I, I, I immediately think about welfare reform, um, that's based on a lot of data, a lot of good data from Mary Jo Bain, David Elwood, who actually argued the opposite of what was presented in the welfare laws. 
They, they argued the opposite, but their data was used to help develop it. And so, and, and, you know, I, I, you know, I'm a policy scientist by, by my doctoral degree. And um, this is one of the things we talked about a lot. And, but the other thing we talked about was that with policy and, and all research, there, there's, there, there are different ways of knowing. There's different ways of, of, of data. And as you're thinking about how to, how to get your story across, you've got to think about your, your audience. And, a, and, and data that, that's published in you know, some obscure journal that three people will read, and those are the people who reviewed it, um, <laughs> that's, you know, that, that's not quite as, that's not as helpful in, in some ways as OX Jane or, or Jezebel, sure. because that's getting the, the, the information out there. And what this tells me is that this is a really, really becomes important for researchers to work with activists. And, and because we can get the data out and we can get it out in a measured way. And when we publish that study, is, you know, and, and, and if the, the right reads it and the left reads it, the, the right might structure it in a way that they want. So then the left, assuming our advocates, our partners, they need to get the story out too. And, and I think there's, you, not that you lose control of your data, but you, you, you want to get it out in a measured yet deliberate way. So, you, so if you're an activist researcher, you, you also need to think about the strategy after you publish that, that piece. Sure. Thank you so much to the panel, and I really appreciate the contributions of the fierce activists. And I know, Robert, your question was rhetorical about, you know, what are tourists doing? Um, but they're, the reason they're not loitering is actually they're, they're consuming or they're, you know, um, supposedly consuming. I think the history of the pier is a history of, you know, public sex, <laughs> really, um, which I think would be interesting to think about in terms of, you know, the public good, the contribution of of kind of queer movements and, and the peers was about performing a, a kind of different occupation of public space that was a refusal to consume and, and even a refusal to have a kind of privatized intimate or sexual life. So that was just a comment about that. And then a question um, for those involved in the, co is it the Coalition for Police Reform? Communities United. Communities United for Police Reform. Um, I mean, I think that's so important, you know, in terms of thinking about reforming or holding the police accountable, but to what extent um, is the activism or the, the kind of discourse also, you know, challenging the notion of security and safety as very militarized? I mean, in the same way that sort of peacekeeping is highly militarized, I think, you know, to what extent can we kind of push past reform and accountability to think about safety and security as located, you know, beyond and outside of uh, you know, a very violent organization. Um, so. Yeah, thank you for that question too. Because so I, I think as, as folks a part of Fierce too, we, like, we understand that being a part of Communities United for Police Reform isn't gonna end brutality from the NYPD or, or like discriminatory practices. We know that that's not the end all be all. Um, even for us at Fierce, like we go into high schools and we go into their gay straight alliances, we go into shelters, um, and oftentimes we get into a conversation around like, let's look at this at um, a, systemic, a systemic problem, right? Uh, it's not just about reform, it might be some other things. How, are, are we having conversations about alternatives to policing? Are we, there's some amazing organizations out there too, like an ally of Fierce's um, is called the Audre Lorde Project, and they do amazing work in Bed-Stuy, Brooklyn, and also um, in New York, they have an office actually in the same building that Fierce is in. Um, and they do some work around alternatives to policing um, and around um, a, a, a safe neighborhood campaign and teaming up with businesses and local residents so that when you're, when you're seeing, um, when you're viewing or observing violence on the streets, you can connect with community residents and local business owners to, 
to try to mediate the situation um, or to try to um, bring folks to a safe space. Because oftentimes what happens, especially for trans women of color in New York, we see that you get into an incident, you're, you're facing violence, you call the NYPD, and then all of a sudden you're criminalized after calling the NYPD for support. Uh, folks that are supposed to protect and serve you, right? So we're continuously having these conversations about alternatives to policing. Um, and also, Fierce is a member of CPR, but also we do our own police accountability work too, whether it has, whether it has to do with holding um, accountability meetings with the NYPD, or Fierce actually does something called Cop Watch every year, um, which is something that not just happens in New York, but it, it happens in the Bay Area, it happens all over, um, internationally as well, um, where organizations like Fierce, the Audre Lorde Project, the Malcolm X um, Grassroots Movement, the Justice Committee here in New York, we go out, um, we go out on the streets, we take video cameras, and we document the activity that NYPD is having with our community folk, um, which, not all the time, but sometimes can de-escalate or prevent bigger things from happening in those moments. Um, but that's one one thing that we do, um, and we know that the work of the like the Community Safety Act. It does, there's this piece around. Okay, we pass some bills, right? Yay! Everything is all. <laughs> fine now. No, there's this piece around also implementation, right? These bills have been passed, but who's going to hold them accountable to, to make sure that these bills are being implemented in New York, or that they're doing it the right way, or that they're um, respecting people, uh, they meaning the NYPD, respecting people when they're having encounters with them on the street. Um, I don't think I have an answer to your question because I think it's a huge question um, and I think it, it involves many different, um, again, I think it involves many different stakeholders and, and uh, uh, bringing those folk to the table um, and that is just one small thing that's happening on the reform level but there are so many other things happening which I will um, uh, just plug getting involved with community grassroots organizations is extremely <laughs> important. Um, it's really important. Um, I just wanted to uh, respond to your comment earlier, which is totally relevant to where the conversation just went, but um, I feel like it's important. So um, I was thinking about what you said about um, um, older people are have a wisdom um, and, and I was thinking like, I have learned so much from my elders and um, my, um, or elders in, in, in the movement. And like Sylvia Rivera, who um, was a Puerto Rican trans woman, and she was like amazing. Look her up if you don't know about her, because you should. And um, I'm, I was just thinking about all these people that I know, my, and even my mother and my grandmother, and. and um, and, and I keep thinking about wisdom, like what does it mean to be wise and um, how do you become wise? Like is it with age? Um, and, and does that mean that, um, what does that mean for the knowledge that young people have? Because we're, we don't have a lot of years on the planet, but so what, is, what do you call that thing that we have, you know? Um, and so I'm thinking like what I have found is that wisdom, um, as, as wise and as much as I value um, my, uh, the elders in my life, I think that wisdom has, it comes from uh, experience as opposed to like thinking about it in terms of age because I think that it makes sense, you know, obviously that older people will be wise and, and possibly wiser than um, some young people and because, you know, you've been here for longer, so you have more time to go through these experiences and these changes and trials and tribulations of life and stuff. Um, but I think that when, when thinking about like queer and trans youth of color, um, we're a lot of times forced to to experience things way ahead of our, our time. And so that creates a wisdom that is far beyond our years to some people. Um, and so, we know that older people have a wisdom that is something, um, how do I say, something priceless. But 
and we already know that, we all know that, you know? But how, how often is it that we have called a young person wise mm. without needing to hear, um, hear them prove it to you, you know? I feel like um, I know that I'm wise, but if I don't know a word or something, you might not think I'm wise. And you mm -hmm. might kind of question my opinions and, um, and the things that I say are facts because I didn't know, you know, like a vocabulary word or whatever. Um, or I haven't experienced something that someone much older than me has. And I feel like um, that, that it's so important to, um, to connect uh, um, through to connect through generations, intergenerational. That's what it is. Um, intergenerational um, organizing and um, collaborative work because there there is so much wisdom within generations and and across generations that together it is something that is like beyond anything you know and and that kind of knowledge is so powerful and and it's knowledge that comes from so many different experiences that queer and trans youth um are experiencing every day because you know like i said we're forced to experience things that we shouldn't um necessarily have to but that's that's, um, you know, that's why we're here, fighting the good fight and all that stuff so that, you know, we can, um, instead of constantly surviving and then being in this state of constant survival, you, you, it kind of alters the way that you, the way that you digest things and the way that you um, talk about things and see things and experience them because survival has such an impact on your mentality and, and the trauma that you carry also um, has such an impact. And so I feel like wisdom is so valuable and it's important that to remember that um, like young people have so much of it too, you know? So, yeah. Indeed, thank you, well said. So I just wanna thank everyone on this panel uh, for your wisdom. <laughs> uh, and thank you all.